people of the sea. It's Wednesday morning, September 24th, 2003, an important day for the people of Diomede. It's the one day a week that mail, food, and supplies are flown into the village. And it's also the one day that residents can travel to and fro from their village.
You see, the village of Daimede is located on the island of Little Daimede in Aluk, 28 miles off the coast of mainland Alaska and one and a quarter miles from Soviet waters. Behind Little Daimede sits the island of Big Daimede. Separating the two islands is the International Date Line, the line between Soviet and American waters. It's also the place where time changes. What do I mean by that? Well, if it's 12 o'clock Wednesday afternoon on Little Diomede, then it's 11 a.m. Thursday morning on Big Diomede. If you're in a boat between the two islands floating on the International Dateline, you can actually go back in time. When the Iron Curtain was formed, Big Diomede became a Soviet military base and all residents living on the island at the time were moved to mainland Russia. During World War II, Little Diomede residents who strayed into Soviet waters were taken captive. Today, there is a small but constant military presence on Big Diomede. At the top of Little Diomede Island, the winds often blow in excess of 50 miles an hour, making for a bumpy ride. And just as you think you're going to be blown away, you reach the edge and you look down in amazement and wonder at the tiny village perched on the cliffs. Located on the west coast of Little Diomede Island in the Bering Straits sits the community of Diomede, home to over 130 residents, mostly Alaska Native or part Native. The Inupiat people of Diomede depend almost entirely upon a subsistence economy for their livelihood because employment is limited to the city and school. <laughs> Edward Sulik holds a pretty important position in this community, maintaining the generators that provide electricity to Diomede. I work for the power plant, uh, power plant operator. When I have time, I go down there and monitor. So I just check the uh, control panel, all the numbers, see if it's running right. You know, phases, three phases. Add oil if you need oil, um, coolant level, that's what I look for. And to keep the generators running smoothly, Edward sings to them in Inupiaq. Orville Akinga Jr., or Oj, as most people know him, does a majority of the electrical work around Diomede and has been extremely busy with the Rural Cap Housing Project. Mainly these are home improvements on the uh, Rural Cap. And uh, they're fixing the homes that really needed the uh, improvements or, or get up to code and wiring or something. Yeah. I've been doing this 13 years. I work with the power plant and uh, manage the utilities. Somehow I managed to, uh, somehow I, I wasn't looking at this job, but somehow I end up getting on it, doing the work for the people here. But I like wiring, and that's what I do. Diomede's water supply comes from the mountain. Melting snow and rainwater from the top of the island are fed from a stream to the community where it fills a 434,000 gallon tank that will serve the community for the rest of the year. Living on Little Diomede can present quite the challenge. Most of the homes are on stilts or are supported by some kind of structure. Some homes need constant leveling 
while others are built rock solid. Either way, it gives new meaning to the phrase, straightening up your home. Currently, Edward is working with Orville on the WorldCat project, doing home improvements and remodeling. Normally, this time of year, people are gearing up for hunting. I want to come all time this time of year. Try to take the weekends off to go hunting. I like to hunt better in fall time or, or there's more game. Right now, the, it's still kind of scarce to seal on the run yet. Not too many. I'd say dimeat is a better part subsistence. It's not as strong as it used to have been, though, you know? It's still, a, it's still very important for the people that are doing it now. They realize what benefits they get off it. Little Diomede is home to thousands of birds which provide eggs and meat for the residents. Bearded and spotted seal find refuge on the islands as well as walrus and are taken for their meat and skins. During the winter, polar bear roam the ice packs and are hunted for their meat and fur. Bowhead and beluga whales are hunted from the edge of the ice packs and are a preferred food. Andrew Kuniak is one of the many hunters here in Diomede. Today, Andrew is taking the North Trail in search of seal. Along the cliffs, several blinds have been built for hunting. But Andrew picks a new spot and now must build his own blind. By stacking rocks on top of each other. Andrew will have a place to stay out of the wind and stay hidden from his prey. For Andrew, this is a way of life that was passed on to him by his elders. With a lack of jobs in the community, a subsistence way of life is essential for everyone. Alaska, fly Frontier, the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier is expanding again. They've added new routes to Nome, Kotzebue, and the surrounding villages. As you can see, Frontier is now really covering Alaska. So the next time you fly, try Frontier. Frontier offers quick, convenient check-in, low fares, and service direct to many of the villages. Frontier Flying Service is the official airline of Heartbeat Alaska. Make it your official airline, too. In the 1890s, pioneers carved a railway through the rugged mountains between Skagway and the Klondike. More than a century later, the White Pass and Yukon route still makes this legendary run. Along the way, life has gotten better for folks working on the railroad, thanks in part to Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska, a health plan that's offered smart choices and quality coverage to the people of Alaska since before it was a state. Primera Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alaska. We're here. We're with you. What's up, bro? Hey, man. You got an extra smoke? Nah, I quit smoking. Seriously? Wow. Cool four-wheeler. Now, how can you afford that, man? I told you. I quit smoking. Tobacco isn't just robbing you of your good health. What could you do with all that money that's now going up in smoke? Call the quit line now. 1-888-842-QUIT. Oh, yeah. It's free.
Once upon a time, there was a wise man who built his house in the Northland where it's cold, where the wind blows, but he had a Toyo stove. The Toyo Stove Laser 60 AT with the wood fireplace design is the perfect direct vent heating system for your home. A force flue pipe design for venting results in maximum efficiency and a large circulation fan distributes clean heat quickly and evenly throughout your house. Papa, you're the wise man. You have a Toyo Stove. Arigah. Yes, I've been, you know, I cook for my, my parents too, so when they were, you know, when they were leaving, so. I love cooking. I don't know why. <laughs> this is always hard. You know, and then this, this spring, and cut it up in, into, uh, you know, the pot size, and dip lock and freeze it. So they, they always come in handy like that. I, I never try to overcook the walrus heart. When you cook them too long, they get real hard. Yeah, got to cook them just right, too. Frances Ozena has a busy day ahead of her. Two days ago, her husband caught a spotted seal that needs to be cleaned and put away. For the next few hours, Francis will be busy preparing barrel foods. First, we're going to go downstairs and look at the barrel food I put away. I worked on the spring. And there's going to be, I'll explain to you what's in there and how I prepared them as I pull them out for an elder. Don't slip. Wooden barrels are used to store foods throughout the year and are usually kept outside. Uh, this is where my barrels are. Um, they're lined on the outside because they're so old, but it's not, it's got uh, thick plastic on the inside because I can't use it. You know, it will leak if I put seal oil in it. So those are old barrels. I wish I had more light down here. Okay, first thing I'm gonna do is put in I'm going to put in my walrus kidney I cooked half dried. I cooked them, cut them, and put them in. And then I'll pull out what I have in here. OK, inside the barrel is sterile seal oil. And the first thing I'm going to pull out is, they call this coke. And that's walrus skin with a little bit of blubber, cooked then put in. And this is dry meat from Ugruk. And this is a half dry seal rib. Back inside the house, we get a better look at some of the native foods Francis has stored in the barrel. This is uh, what we call coke. Walrus skin. See, there's the piece of the blubber. This is, this is the, the hand of the walrus. This is the, the, here, let me find a better one. Not, this is kind of dark. Right here is the, we call mamoon. It's uh, breast milk, walrus. A little bit of blubber on top and a little bit of the meat. And this is the kidney I put in, half-dried kidney, horse kidney. And there's the braided half-dried intestines. The seal meat must now be cut into manageable pieces and the meat cut away from the blubber. Um, I'm taking off the extra meat that was left on there. 
so I can take, I want to have this blubber to make more seal oil and blubber, because I don't got enough seal oil for the winter. But first, the skin, which will be used for clothing, must be separated from the blubber. Nothing will go to waste on this animal. Even the intestines are used. This is seal blubber, extra seal oil. I want to make an extra blubber. Of course, the top is dry. I'm not going to keep that, but I'll keep what's underneath. And here is the seal heart, which my husband got a seal a couple days ago. And I'm going to fry that up. I'm going to rinse these, and I'm going to hang the intestines up. Two ways you can do with seal intestines is hang them dry, and the kids eat them after you rinse them, or you braid them up and cook them in with your um, seal meat, and it'll be boiled. Usually I'm pretty fast at these. It's a little sticky, too. The biggest part about living in dye meat is subsistence. I was told in the past, before we changed our lifestyle, that it was really important to learn how to survive in dye meat. I started late in life. I started maybe when my kids were just toddlers, my first three. And normally, they would start as early as five, six years old. And I didn't. It just part of me just wasn't ready to learn. But when I learned to, to preserve food, you know, I started late, but I enjoyed it. I'm not just talking about just barrel food. I'm talking about fermenting, you know, gathering greens, crabs, freezing stuff for, you know, to eat later during the winter. There are two stores in Diomede, but prices are high due to the cost of shipping. And there are often times when bad weather keeps flights out of Diomede for weeks on end. The hardest part is traveling. Going out of dye meat is easy, but trying to come back is really tough. You can get stranded in wells for weeks or months. On September 25th, an 8.0 earthquake struck Japan. A tsunami warning was issued all the way from the Seward Peninsula north to Little Diomede. When news hit Diomede, the siren was sounded in town, and the men began moving boats up onto higher ground. Preparation is the key to survival in the Bering Straits. Fortunately, a tsunami never formed. It's easy to see how different and sometimes complex it can be to live in Diomede. From the limited barge service to the seasonal plane service, living on Little Diomede has its challenges. Well, you have to learn how to live with your basics because it's hard to get stuff out here and it's really expensive. You have to be able to handle all the isolation because we don't have, we don't have everyday mail service. We don't have everyday airplanes like all the other villages. And the past year or so, we don't even have any kind of communication with Alaska because we don't get the ARCS channel and all our satellite TV comes from California. Perhaps their limited contact with the outside keeps them more grounded in their own culture. They were raised on the foundation of a subsistence lifestyle. They know how to read the water and the sky. They know where to find myrrh eggs and they know how to survive on the place some call the rock. You have to know the the current, you have to know the weather situation. Why is the, the clouds are forming? Why are they dying, dying down? Which way is the wind blowing? Is the most important things out here where the weather always the thing that we have to rely on, especially the current. From the elders to the youth, and so on and so on, the ways of the Igmang Liut have been passed down from generation to generation. Orville Sr. recalls the first time he went hunting with the adults and elders. By well, my youngest time, I think I remember when I was about 16 or 17, I think that's the first time I went with the, uh, the hunting crew. 
I remember the elders were in charge of the building. Now it, uh, I've been some, I spent some time in the military. It was like military. You gotta have discipline in the boat. You gotta be organized. You gotta be prepared for anything. So the elders those days were the strict people. They know what, how it's done, you know, the proper way. Mainly you survive, how to survive. How to make a living. How to prepare for the upcoming weather situation and stuff like that. You have to be prepared, you know, those days. There were three villages here around here. When I was growing up, there were three villages, existing villages, one up the north side of Big Diamond, one on the other side, the main village, and this village over here. So these two islands were pretty much together. They had the same language, same way of living then. So, so we have relatives from there. So pretty, pretty close, those days.